Well, good morning. I also would like to give a special welcome to any visitors who are with us. We're always grateful when you come to worship the living God together in the bond that we have in Christ. So just grateful for you, grateful for Southside Bible Church. Um, before we pray, just um, blessed by what I experienced this morning. I was in the Attributes of God class and just watching these, these young men laboring in the attributes. And this morning we're going to look at the kingdom of God. And I'm just watching all these people where they've come from and their understanding of the wisdom of God and its applied knowledge and that everything's unto the glory. And they're just navigating all these huge truths and they're landing so practical, living for God. And I was just smiling going, the kingdom of God has come. And then I walk in here and all the Greek guys from the Greek class are just glowing. And I'm like, what about Greek made you glow this morning? <laughs> and they were like, we looked at Ephesians 1, 4, that he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. And it's an aorist. And I mean, they're just giddy about the love and choice of God and what grace he has placed upon us. So to God be the glory for these great gifts and truths of what he's doing in our hearts. So let's continue to look at Jesus and, and behold him and become like him. And that's my prayer for every soul here this morning. Let's go to the throne of grace. Father, I thank you that it is a throne of grace. If it wasn't, we would all be condemned to hell for all of eternity. And your grace was shed abroad. It was put upon us through the Lord Jesus Christ by your spirit. Lord, we thank you that you took us from death and you brought us to spiritual life and you've changed our stony, selfish hearts that were blind to now they see the glory of Christ and we love it, we praise it, we adore it, we want to be conformed to it. And so I pray this morning that we will take another step forward in how do we live and please the King of Kings. And so teach us, continue to set us free and make us like you. And so, God, I thank you for the word of God. I thank you we don't have to depend on man's wisdom, that we get to open up the wisdom of God and look into it. Teach us by your spirit. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Turn with me to Romans chapter 14. Romans chapter 14. It's been cool, exciting for me just to watch how God runs his kingdom. And what I love about his kingdom is it, the way I always figure it out, it's always the opposite of the world. You could, you, if you ever want to know God's kingdom, look at the world and it's the opposite every time. You, you enter into this kingdom not by might, power, your own merit. You come in, he said, poor in spirit with nothing, nothing of your own, not your own boots, bootstraps, morality. You come with an empty hand as a beggar saying, be merciful to me the chief of sinners, uh, looking to the finished work of Jesus Christ alone for entrance. That's how you get into the kingdom of God. And now you're accepted, you're adopted, you're loved, you're under grace. I wish every believer here this morning could just get the fullness of how loved and accepted you are by God and his work in Jesus Christ. You are under grace. And when you get this, you offer up your body, a living sacrifice to God. Here's my offering. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. And you come to Romans 12, 2. And he says, now don't be conformed to this world. Don't think and act like it. The, the old kingdom, the kingdom of this world, don't do it. But instead, be metamorphosed, be transformed. How do we get changed? By the renewing of your minds so that you can approve this testing what the will of God is, that which is good, acceptable, and perfect. The will of God's perfect. And I want to keep renewing my mind in this word to know the will of God. I got to offer up my body a living sacrifice, then I need to know what's pleasing. And so thank you, God, for this word to keep journeying and showing us. So we've been renewing our minds as to what the will of God is for his blood-bought children. And in Romans 13, 8 through 10, he summarized it. <clears> Owe <throat> oh, nothing to anyone except to love one another, for he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. For this you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and if there's any other commandment, it's summed up in this saying, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfillment of the law. And we call that the law of Christ, and all the commandments hang upon this great commandment. 
And then we saw Paul said, love uses your gifts to build up one another in Christ. They don't puff you up. They make you humble. And we enter into this body in humility with our gifts to serve it and to build it up. We love without hypocrisy. When I was an unbeliever, you can only love with hypocrisy. And now you have the ability by the gospel of Jesus Christ to love sincerely, not perfectly, sincerely. And God is setting us free to love in a whole different way. We even love our enemies. We don't take our own revenge and retaliations. We love even enemies. We, we have love even toward authorities, governmental authorities and our leaders. He exhorts us in love then. He says, I want you to wake up. What time is it? Know the time and wake up and put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Quit living in this old kingdom that was the kingdom of the God of this world that was death. Wake up. Quit, quit making your life in that kingdom. You're in a new kingdom. You've been transferred from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ and be done with that. Move out in love. Even when I don't feel like it, get, just give your lives to the king and loving him and loving others. Just don't make it self-love the rest of your life. Wake up. Look at the gospel. Go love. The time is now. And then we moved into the longest application in this whole letter. Would have never predicted this. Christian liberty on issues that aren't bound by commandments, essential doctrines that unite us. These issues are not sin in and of themselves. But he's teaching us they can become sin based on our attitudes and our motives and our convictions on these matters. And so it's crazy how much these are the issues that have been used to destroy the church of God by our arch enemy. I've seen them destroy individuals, our unity, families, marriages, friendships, these little molehill issues, if not understood and dealt with in a way that pleases God, is sin. And they can stumble and actually hurt the brethren. So it's a mountain issue how we deal with the molehill issues like eating meat, wine, and special days. It is, a, it is infinitely important to God and Paul and the Holy Spirit how we deal with this. So you're like, man, this is like the third or fourth sermon on this. Just, there's got to be a reason, right, that Paul would spend so much time on this. And I just want to know, you know, as one of your pastors, we get this wrong a lot. And if you think you already figured it out, well, you just keep laboring with me. There's more to figure out. So <clears throat> we're going to look at the way God runs his kingdom. And he runs it in a unity of the doctrines of salvation and the church and glorification. In Ephesians 4, he lays out some of them. So what, what brings us together is this amazing unity of faith in Jesus Christ and the work of God. Unity on the commands of God, helping each other walk in them and lead each other into repentance when we don't. It's powerful. And where the world, and sadly the church in some areas is gone, is the way we try to get unity is to all agree on these differences that we're studying. And you all got to dress the same, think the same, look the same, have every same conviction. And we think that's going to bring unity. And it has never worked. <laughs> it doesn't. We, we can't give room for liberty, freedom of conscience to, to guide and to direct each other in these things. And God says on these issues that we're studying, you have freedom. And we can have differences on them and stay united. Isn't that amazing? You can differ on these little molehills and stay together as one because you're one in Jesus Christ and have the exact same hope and are journeying for the same things. In fact, if we handle our differences rightly in these areas, we can glorify, glorify God even more by our unity with our differences and having strong convictions on them. We can show God more glory because we're different on all these things and unified. That, that will show forth God more than everybody dressing and thinking and acting the same way. Beautiful. That's the kingdom of God. So Paul's instructing us, how do I think God's thoughts then on these issues and dwell together in love and holiness and be pleasing to him? That's the new believer's heart. I want to know that. So this is big. It's big. It's, it's working in our midst. It's transforming some of you by the comments I'm getting. And some of you, it's cooking your grits and you're mad. And I want you just to keep staring. Is this God's word? Is this is what he's saying? And, and, and if he is, bring your will under his. This is how you're going to offer up a pleasing sacrifice. So if, it, if it's messing with you, it's, it's good. That's God. That's the Holy Spirit. 
Uh, don't, don't resist. All right. I, I moved away and lost my notes. Okay. Have your way with us, Lord. Come with me this morning to the Word of God. Let's pray. Have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way. Lead us and guide us this morning. Help us to look at this Word and keep understanding it and not miss our own lives. God, we are spin doctors. We, we're, we are so easily deceived. We can spot judgment on conscience issues and everybody else and miss them in our own heart. Please come do the surgery that we all need. Help us to start with us and then move out for how to help the body. So God, please be merciful to your children and your people this morning, I pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. So as we move into Romans 14, Paul says there's two kinds of groups. There's those who are strong in the faith. And this is someone who really understands the gospel. And, and they understand that the laws of cleanness and what was unclean in the Old Testament and the law of Moses has been fulfilled in Christ. They, they get that. And now he's, he's made me clean before God by the work of Jesus. I'm clean. And now he said, uh, Christ said, what goes into a man doesn't defile him, but what comes out. So quit worrying about what you eat and all of those things, because that's not what makes you dirty. What makes you dirty is these hearts, and what comes out of those things are what make a man unclean. So Jesus in the Gospels does something major. He declares, he says, all things are clean now. And then you come in Acts where, Peter, I, I'll never eat something that's, that's defiled. And, and Cornelius comes and you, the whole thing that went on, there's just a hangover in Paul or Peter. or Yeah, Peter. And they got a journey out now of all that they were raised in and how they think about the law and what's righteous. And some of you have been raised in something even similar. And you got to keep journeying in grace to clear out some of these old ways. And that is who Paul calls the weak. The, the weak are, are still really bound by a lot of those external things and what makes you holy and what doesn't. And, and so they're, they're struggling with those issues. And don't miss, we talked about it a lot, the weak are believers. And they're trying to please and glorify God. They, they want what's best. And they think by not having this is what's going to glorify God the most. So when he calls us to come together, we're unified that we all want the glory of God and we want to please him. So don't miss that foundation. That's where we need to start, okay? Are you with me? <coughs> All right. I like amens. It means you're still awake. We learned the wrong way to deal with these issues. So what's the wrong way? Well, to judge the person who's eating the meat or to look down and condemn the one who isn't always oh, so shallow or not receive one another on these issues. And I you know, we went to the communion table, and I want you to pray over that. Is there someone you're not receiving over these kind of issues? I, I've watched this break up families, and it's unbelievable what this can do. And then he taught us the right way to deal with these. How, how do I deal with it? His biggest burden and the command is receive one another into your intimate heart and relationship and homes. Trust God to make that brother or sister stand. It, on these issues, it's not up to me. They, they can stand even without my great convictions on these areas. And then he says, make your decisions on these issues based on the glory of God. And I love that in verse 8 is, you know, if, if I live, it's going to be for Christ. And if I die, it's going to be for Christ. So all, all my decisions as I look at these things is I just want to please Christ. And so if I don't eat or I do eat, just let me please Christ. And then he came last time we were together and said, you're going to stand before God on judgment day and give an account of what you approved and disapproved and your heart motives and your attitudes, and they should show forth a child of God by how you dealt with these issues. And so Paul's not done. So neither am I, and neither are you. Sorry. Okay. We looked at the first tablet. How do we glorify God in these decisions? And now Paul's going to come, and we're going to look at the second tablet. How do I love my neighbor, the law of Christ, and all these issues. And so we're going to look at verses 13 through 23, and I'm going to give you a brief outline of how we're going to journey this. In verses 13 through 16, Paul says, and it's interesting now, the rest of this chapter, he's kind of exhorting the strong. I, I almost ex would expect him to exhort the weak, but he's coming harder now after the strong. So strong, if that's you, 
And I've never met anyone ever say they're the weak one. Everyone says, I'm the strong one. He's the, he's the weak one. And that's what Paul's after. <clears throat> so he says, be careful how you use your freedom. Strong brother in the gospel. And then in verses 19 through 23, he says, be constructive with your freedom. Build each other up. Build each other up now in these issues. And I call this the hinge verse in the middle of it in verses 17 through 18. And and in the middle of these things, Paul's going to stop and say, let me tell you what really matters. The kingdom of God isn't about eating and drinking, but about righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. So he's just going to kind of bring us all this morning to what really matters. And this is what I'm praying for every one of you this morning. What really matters to you? And if what really matters to you is only these conscience issues, you have some dealings with God this morning. And I want to bring your hearts and your minds to say, this is what really matters. Don't spend all your days on what doesn't really matter. So look with me in the first point, verse 13. Be careful. Therefore, man, I love that word. Let us not judge one another anymore, but rather determine this, not to put an obstacle or a stumbling block in a brother's way. So we always say, what is it there for? What's it connected to? Well, it's connected to this whole chapter, but I think it's, it's really closely connected to this emphasis of judgment. And you're going to quit judging everyone. You're going to stand before God in judgment. And now Paul says, let us not judge one another, but rather determine this. And it's a play on words here in the Greek. I love all you guys with your inner linears now. Grab this. The word for judge is used twice, but with different nuances. And so he says, let us not judge one another, condemning, censorous, uh, uh, on the practice of these doubtful things with conscience, but literally, but rather judge this, judge this. <laughs> you want to judge? Judge this. Know your brothers well enough so as not to put a stumbling block in their way. I, I actually want to know how your convictions and some of the things you struggle with, because I don't want to trip you up. I'm going to spend more time judging that than you aren't keeping my super holy standards. Judge how the practice of your liberty affects your brother or sister. Get caught up in that, is what Paul's saying. Is that your burden? Is that what you're caught up in? Get a fixed resolve to not put a stumbling block in your brother or sister's way. Isn't that more like Christ than, hey, what what do I like the most? I just like this. What's best for me? The law of Christ is my life for yours I want to give your life for you to make it to glory. That's what unites us this morning. I want you to make it to glory. I want to give my life to help you get to glory. I care about stumbling blocks in your life. I don't want to hurt you on your way to glory. I want to help you. I want to, here's the assist, Mr. Assist Man. So if you want to look at something critically, look at how what you do will affect others. Two different paradigms, two worlds, two kingdoms. One is I exist just for my pleasure and my will and my freedom. And the other is I care about your faith and your conscience and your blessing. They're just extreme, but this is the the law of Christ right here before you. So judge this. Don't put an obstacle or a stumbling block in a brother's way or their path. And I want you to picture, you know, I was just thinking through this. This is probably a stupid illustration, but picture a little boy just running down the the sidewalk at his grandparents' house, and he's just running full speed. (coughs) And grandpa's walking by on the sidewalk. I'm going to step up so you can see it. And the kid's just hauling by, and he goes, and the kid goes sprawling and cuts his chin, and he's all scraped up. And and you're like, what are you going to think? Grandfather says, hey, that's my liberty. I can put my foot out if I want. That's my property doesn't matter that I just tripped my grandkid and destroyed him. That I just, as I was thinking of that, that is so violating as a grandpa. I might, I, keep your kids away from me. <laughs> <laughs> In the spiritual realm, I just want you to hear this. That is what Paul's talking about. Stronger brother, weaker brother just walking along and you go, just trip him. I'm so focused on my liberty that I stuck my little foot out and I tripped him. And so Paul's just saying, don't put an obstacle. This Greek word is a stone that causes people to stumble or to trip them. 
It took on a metaphorical meaning to mean a spiritual downfall in the New Testament. You'll remember back to Romans 9, 32 through 33, that the, that the Jews stumbled over the stumbling stone, Jesus, that he's the way to get righteous, and they looked to the law to do it themselves. So they stumbled, they tripped. 1 Corinthians 8, 9, he says, don't become a stumbling block to the weak. So a stumbling block, the Greek word is a trap. And, and you'd, you could make a little box. Some of you may have done this as a kid. And you, you hold it up with a stick and you have a bait inside the box and the animal would come in. And when he did, you're just like, got him. Romans 11:9. 9, it says, uh, let their table be a snare and a trap. I'm going to just read. Listen to Romans 16, 17. I urge you, brethren, keep your eye on those who cause dissensions and hindrances contrary to the teaching which you learned and turn away from them. Those who are putting traps and tripping people up. This is big. This is big. So guys, let's think through this now. I think this is important. It took me a long time to figure this out in my Christian life. This is not a call to avoid what someone else may disagree with. Okay, I bet there's people throughout this, you have so many differences, right? We don't all agree on these things. So do I just got to hide and do none of my conscience issues because I don't want to hurt a weaker brother? Is it the lowest common denominator? We'll just get the lowest, weakest conscience and we'll all live by that so we don't trip anyone up. I I say that's impossible because we have 10,000 different issues and thoughts sitting here this morning. I know that's not what he's talking about and I think I can show it from the scriptures. This is not a call to just be chameleons and go to the lowest common denominator. This is a call to consider our conduct that we would bring one another into sin because of his weak conscience. So it's not just giving an offense. It's not, I don't like your conscience issue. I don't agree with you. That's not where I land. That's not what he's talking about. There's a big difference. It, it, what it is, is it's something that starts the ball rolling that's going to trip you up big time. And meat and vegetables. Neither was sinning. They're both fully convinced in their own conscience. And so you, you're sitting here at a fellowship and there's a guy with pork chops and a ham sandwich with bacon just dripping down his hand. And he's chowing down and he's just saying, I give thanks to you, God, for this bacon. And then there's a guy next to him eating broccoli and coleslaw. And he, he looks at that ham sandwich and he's like, oh, that looks so good. And there's this group of solid brothers. And so I, I had to, Ron Troy was, came up to me before the service. This, this was not fair. He said, you know, the issue of not eating meat or vegetables only, he says, the vegetables feed the cows and then you eat the meat. It's terrible. <laughs> this group of solid brothers and sisters then are looking down on me. So that they're the mature ones, the stronger ones, and, and they're just kind of egging them on a little bit. And he's saying, you know what? I want to be accepted. I, I want to be accepted with those meat eaters. That sandwich looks good. And, and if my brother, who's more mature than me, is over there eating it, maybe I can too. Pass the pork. And he lays down that night, and his conscience is screaming, and all the peer pressure is gone, and he's wounded that he sinned against God, and he's in despair. He has no peace of mind. And that brother has been greatly hurt by that. I remember when I first got saved, um, I got saved from a pretty wild life, and Laura was in this sweet little Southern Baptist church, and she, the next Sunday she started taking me, and a lot of guys that I knew from high school were in this college group, and they invited me to a fellowship they were having, and I had never been more excited in my life because all I wanted to do was leave this world and hang out with brothers and sisters. And for me, new conscience, I never want to see alcohol the rest of my life. And I come to play pool with these new friends, and they all start pulling out the beer. And I'm just sitting there going, wait a minute, I'm trying to figure it out. And being so weak, I joined in. And then I came home that night, and I can't tell you the depth of pain that I felt in my heart when I got home, because I I knew I didn't want that. And and I, I think... They're kind of like, here's this guy that just got saved. We want to show him we're cool. I don't know what it was, but it just wounded me. On the other end, I knew a guy who 
had a really, really strong conviction on alcohol. And his stance was, if anyone drinks it, they're, they're alcoholics and they're in sin and it's, and it's wrong. And so what do you do with this group now who has freedom in that? And is it lowest common denominator then? Or it was in no way going to stumble this guy to drink it. He's stumbling in legalism by holding his judgment and his standard by anyone who does this. And so I just want you to see, you got to work through these issues. It's not just, um, I, I disagree with what you're doing. Am I going to trip them up by leading them into doing what my freedom has brought me to do? So any questions? I'm serious. If you want to throw them out, I'll try. I'm trying to help you understand the issue. So look at verse 14 with me. I know and I'm convinced in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself, but to him who thinks anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. And so I love this. Paul says, I'm convinced. I know it and I'm convinced in the Lord Jesus. Strong words, emphatic Uh, It's probably saying what what I've learned from Christ and the gospel, what I learned from Christ and his earthly ministry where he declared all things clean. I've learned this, that nothing is unclean in itself. And again, this is on these conscience issues and the the eating or not. This, This doesn't mean that there's nothing unclean. There's all kinds of things declared unclean in sin in the Bible. So don't fall off the cliff. And so right now, there's nothing unclean in itself, and all the strong people in the church are high-fiving, going, amen. Eat eat all the meat you want. Food will never commend us to God. It's not food that defiles a man, but what comes out of his heart, food's not the problem. But then Paul uses this word for unclean. You know what the root word is? Koinonia, where we get that word for fellowship, to have in common. It's a, it's a rich word. The Jews began to use it uh, to denote those things that by virtue of what they considered inappropriate contact with the ordinary, the secular, or the world were ritually, uh, ritually defiled or unclean. So that, oh, you're beautiful. Hey guys, after the service, hug that man. And then is the air conditioning on? I know some of you hate the air conditioning on, but man, it's hot, isn't it? Or is it just I'm fired up? I'm dripping. Okay, so that shows that Paul is not saying that there's nothing at all that is absolutely evil or sinful, but this is a ritual defilement as defined in the Old Testament Jewish law. (laughs) So there is no ceremonial uncleanness. Uh, We've been made clean in the heart, and there's nothing sinful or inherently impure about these issues. But here's here's the kicker. It would be so easy if we could just walk away with that. But Paul says that's not true for everyone. To him who thinks anything is unclean, to him it is unclean. Wait, Paul, nothing's unclean, but if you think it is unclean, it is unclean. A little translation might help here. To the one who reckons something unclean, to that one it is unclean. So he's thought through this, and and, and his conscience is telling him, this is unclean, and now Paul's saying to you, it is it violates his conscience. Never do what you think to be wrong. If your conscience says, do not do it, don't do it. So yes, we're, we're going to learn you have to calibrate your conscience. There, there's some of you who your conscience, it, it's overreacting and some it's underreacting. And so you're always growing by the truth and filling your mind to calibrate your conscience for what it approves and disapproves. But too many just violate conscience. And Paul's concern here is you keep doing that and you begin to sear your conscience, and it quits working. And all of a sudden, there, there is no conviction against sin. And if you go against your conscience and make it a pattern, uh, you just become a spineless jellyfish that floats around with the world in the spirit of the age. So that's our principle in this scripture. Don't judge your brother, but judge how your liberty will affect your brother. Love him and build him up. So what is clean to you is not to him if he does it. You need to get that. If he's convicted, I can't do that, but for you it's clean, and you get him to do it, you hurt your brother. It's amazing that you can do the exact same thing. You could eat the same burger, and for one, it's sin. 
So keep that in mind in our interactions. Why don't you just come watch this movie with us? My conscience says you can't watch these kind of movies. You know, now just come, come on. Just listen to this one song. You're not going to go to hell for one ACDC song. Or slander them because they don't partake with you. Come on, come on. You, what are you, a whole here and now? Just come do this. You look sexy in that outfit. Peer pressure on all these issues is sinful. So I want you to see in verse 15, he's going to flush this out. For if because of food your brother then is hurt, you're no longer walking according to the law of Christ to love. Do not destroy with your food him for whom Christ died. For if because of food your brother is hurt. Anything jump out with you in that one statement? For if because of food your brother is hurt. (laughs) Food and your brother. I care way more about my Big Mac attack from my brother who Jesus Christ died for. And this word for hurt, it's in the present passive indicative. It's hurting and it's, they're being acted upon by our freedoms. So it means to be sad or sorrowful or distressed. It was when Peter, when Jesus said, do you love me, Peter? It uses this Greek word, he was distressed. So that's why I'm convinced it's not Obser- just observing your liberty, but it, it's the distress of soul with a weaker brother because he's violated in his conscience. So this is where it gets deep. They're, they're broken. They're distressed of heart. They're, they've offended God. You, you've hurt your brother. So not just, I think, different. And then you come back to that the fulfillment of the whole law is to love your brother, your neighbor as yourself. He says, be devoted to one another and brotherly love. Be devoted to this. Without love, Paul says, you're nothing. And so you can be rejoicing in all your liberties, thanking God and doing it for Him while you're breaking the essence of what God requires of us. Isn't that startling? Love. Love is concerned about the conscience and the convictions of others. So listen, Mr. Liberty. Have you forgotten love? You love liberty, but do you love the brethren? Galatians 5.13, Paul says, don't turn your liberty into an opportunity for, for the flesh, but through love serve one another. Martin Luther said, liberty, a Christian is a man most free Lord of all, subject to none, this freedom that God brings. He says, love, a Christian man is a most dutiful servant of all and subject to all. And then in verse 15, he says, Con- consider this, do not destroy with your food him for whom Christ died. This word for destroy, it, it was a moral disaster. It's in the present tense. And it, it brings ruin to them. It brings a deep sense of guilt. They lose their peace, their joy, their witness, their assurance. So the process is searing their conscience and it can end in perdition. So get this, your, your meat, for your meatball casserole, you ran roughshod over your brother for food. So it was just a a little difference of opinion. You brought great harm. Yeah, but God says it's okay for me to eat my meatball casserole. No, your your liberty here is destroying a brother. You used your liberty like a scalpel in the hand of a baby. You're a spiritual murderer. I wonder how many have quit running because of these offenses. This has arrested my soul. And then he holds up the most beautiful gem in all of Scripture, next, next to this word, you, you destroy him for whom Christ died. That just brought weight to my heart. I've hurt, I've destroyed my brother for whom Christ died. He didn't consider equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself, taking on the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men and being found in appearance as a man He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even to death on a cross. He gave up everything so he could save us. And you won't give up a ham sandwich for your brother. Christ gave up everything for the the weaker brother's soul, and you won't give up your wine. It just seems crazy, doesn't it, when you put it like that? You just kind of sink in shame if you've done this. Just, it seems so small. 
Judas sold him for 30 pieces of silver and I sold him for a piece of meat. Let us be shackled with the chains of love to the brethren. Not be selfish and seek our own, but for that which builds up the body of Christ. Therefore, in verse 16, do not let what is for you a good thing be spoken of as evil. Don't let this freedom that we have in Christ be spoken of as evil because I've hurt and I've destroyed the body of Christ. And what I want to move, we need to keep moving, is I want to move to the second point, the linchpin, and I want to consider the cause then. He says, therefore, in verse 17, or 16, therefore, don't let what is for you a good thing be spoken of as evil for, for the kingdom of God. Don't, don't let for you what is a, a good thing, a stronger brother with liberty that's right, don't let it be spoken of as evil, blasphemed. The believer is exercising his liberty, no big thing, but he hurts his brothers. Others will speak evil of your liberty, see the hurt, the fighting, the dissensions, and all that's going on, and God is blasphemed. This is the unity of the Spirit has to become so much to us. Don't let this good thing be the instrument that wounds a brother, and then the world jumps on it and parades it around and blasphemes God. Because the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy and the Holy Spirit. Mic drop, isn't it? Just here you are arguing about your pork and your meat and your drinks. And he's just like, that's not what the kingdom of God is about. Let's go to what this new kingdom is about. I've been a Christian 35 years. And what I have seen in the church, these issues are way too often the focus. They always get their floats at the parade whether you eat meat or not, whether your dress can only go to your knees or your ankles. We went over these things, whether the music beat has to be a four or a three or what instruments you have to have. Can you only sing hymns? Can you only sing choruses? Can I put on lipstick and jewelry and some sparkles? Which sports are sinful and not? Football's not. If you breastfeed, bottle feed, epidural, none, I, I can go on forever with the baby stuff. <laughs> Courting, dating, birth control or not, organic food or GMOs, dancing, playing cards, the moderate use of wine or none. These are the issues that all you think about. And what I want you to hear, that is all necessary. I'm not saying you don't have to get convictions. We've learned that. Get a conviction but the working out of your salvation. What Paul says right now is that is not what the kingdom of God is about. And maybe there's something bigger than what our hearts should be enraptured with. Maybe there's something bigger. Maybe those things are not our chief end or our chief preoccupation. Maybe Christianity is bigger than all of that. For some of you, this series is messing with you that is what the kingdom of God was about for you. You've, you've shared it. All, all it was was those issues, our fundamentalism. We just felt so righteous and holy by doing all those things. That was the measure and the standard in all our churches. You have judged and you've condemned and you've looked down on everyone else for these issues. And this is so beautiful. We're all running around with our cameras so out of focus. And Paul, and, and just... Three little statements does a few twists for perfect vision. Righteousness, peace, and joy are what the kingdom of God is all about. I love when Nicodemus comes up to Jesus and he says to him, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus said, how can a man be born when he's old? He cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb to be born, can he? And Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he can't enter into the kingdom of God. You will not see it. You will not enter into it unless you're born again by the Spirit of God. And when you're born again, the kingdom of God, you're brought into it. Christ told a parable and said, the kingdom of God is upon them. Christ defeated the enemy, death, the devil, sin, the law. He, he ransomed the church of God. He purchased her and said, all authority on heaven and earth is given to me, this kingdom. And this is now, it's not an earthly kingdom right now. 
And so it's not us all ruling over the land. Pilate said, you're king? And he says, yes, but not an earthly king. Jesus said, my kingdom's not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would be fighting that I might not be delivered up to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not of this realm. It's an entirely different sort of kingdom. It's a spiritual kingdom. And the citizens are brought in by redemption. They're born again. Jesus' blood, poor in spirit, faith brings you into that kingdom. And it's where Christ is ruling and reigning now over the hearts of men. Is he ruling and reigning over your heart this morning? That's his citizens. God, he's, I'm in his kingdom because my heart is surrendered to the king and I love him and I trust him and I seek to please him. So maybe there's something bigger. <clears throat> it's an entirely different sort of kingdom. It's spiritual. And we're brought in by redemption. And unless you're born again, you can't see the kingdom of God. And we're saved. And now by faith, we're under the rule of Christ. And this kingdom, Jesus said, is like leaven. It's spreading through the world. And the gospel's going forth. And people are coming into this kingdom by faith in Christ and under his rule. And our lives then are given to advance this kingdom. That's what you exist for. To advance this kingdom that Christ has brought in. Our citizenship is in heaven. Our lives are not for this earth. It's not, how do I get as much as I can, spend as much on myself and all these things till I leave? So many think, I, I, I get all this and, and then I die and go to heaven. Your primary calling is to this kingdom. Your talents, your time, your money, your prayers, your sufferings, it, it's all to the kingdom of God and its advancement. And so the question is very simple this morning, is that where your heart is? Is your whole life given to building this kingdom here? Or is it the, the kingdom that matters that we've been brought into under the rule and reign of Christ? Oh my, you, you could get people to quit wearing eyeliner, quit playing cards, get them to quit celebrating Christmas, give up beer or start drinking it, not get a vaccination, wear a mask, and not have advanced the kingdom of God one bit. I just see people giving their lives to the wrong things. Fighting and tearing down the kingdom of God. Things that the kingdom of God are not about. The application's endless. What are you seeking first? Young man, young woman, as you're setting out, what are you going to set out for? You maybe just got your degree and you graduated. What are you going to go? What are you, what's your purpose? House, 3.2 kids and a dog? I just bought a new house. What's my goal? Just got married. What are we shooting at? 60-year-old man, just retired. What are you going to seek? This has been my prayer for Romans since we started. What are we seeking? Thy kingdom come daily. How do we advance his kingdom? A kingdom that's about righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit is what we're going to take up next week. So what are you about? I just want you to stop this morning, and I really do. I want you to truly answer this before God, who knows every heart. Has the gospel of Romans 1 through 11, the most beautiful thing I've ever seen in my life, has it taken up your heart with a justification before God that is eternal and unchangeable? Your acceptance with God can never be broken or taken away. All because of the work of Christ and the decree of God. A gospel message that I am now a debtor to all men to love the brethren, even with my liberties. In fact, I, you know why I have liberty? To love. To love God and love other people. That's what I'm seeking in my life and in my heart. Here's my heart, Lord. Take what is yours. Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. Seek this kingdom first. That's what this is about. Next week, we're going to finish this chapter. 
Lord willing. But I just pray that we would get this. This is so powerful about what the kingdom of God is really about. And I just desire that Southside uh, doesn't spend its days uh, building only on conscience issues, but on what the kingdom of God is really about. Righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. May we give our lives to the things that really matter. Father, we repent before you this morning. We're so easily distracted. We, we're experts at straining gnats and swallowing camels. Those gnats just seem so important. Just got to make sure everybody swallows my gnat. And yet, Lord, we're swallowing camels. So we're not loving one another. We're more focused on our own pleasures and our own convictions and peer pressuring one another instead of, I just want to love you. I want to help you make it to glory. God, grow us in this. Let us be free and let us be so known for the, the, the mountains, the Romans 1 through 11, beautiful, gorgeous doctrines. God, let us love the, the excellent, great things and not spend our days on the, the things that don't sanctify. God, let us handle these issues in a way that please you. Lord, this is about how to offer up our bodies a living sacrifice. We want to be pleasing. Please lead us and guide us and teach us. Set any brother free this morning who's been lost in this. And if there's anyone who's walked in this morning, let them see the love of God in Christ Jesus who gave himself up for us on a cross and delivered us from the condemnation of Almighty God. What greater love than this? Melt hearts, I pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.